Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Nanoproof Series webinar where today we're going to be talking about PCB water protection technology. During the webinar this afternoon, we will talk about, give you a quick overview of Aculant to talk about then our technology and then get into some detail regarding our waterproofing series of products called Nanoproof. And then we'll spend a little bit of time on devices. Some of you have, are in the device business, portable or handheld devices, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, we did a webinar earlier today and we had lots of questions. I would encourage you to look at the control panel and to type in your questions as you go and then we'll try and tackle as many as we can at the end of the, uh, the webinar today. My name is Edward Hughes. I'm the CEO of Aculon, uh, producers of the Nanos Proof Series of Products. I'm joined here today with me with Eric Hansen, our Vice President of Technology and a co-creator of the Nano Proof Series, as well as Josh Garrison, a technologist and also the co-creator of the Nano Proof Series. These two gentlemen will be handling some of the more detailed technical questions as we go into this presentation. Let me start by giving you a quick overview of Aculon. Some of you may be familiar with us, but for those of you who aren't, uh, we are a surface modification company. And we like to think that we are surface solution experts in that we supply treatments to uh, large marketplaces, including the oil and gas consumer products and electronics. Uh, we currently have over 25 commercial programs. So we focus on providing and selling treatments uh, to companies and then obviously for you to do the application. We surround the uh, technology with a very strong intellectual property portfolio. We have 28 granted patents and another 15 in process. Our primary business is related to repellency technology where we modify surfaces in seconds with little or no capital. One of the primary differentiators from other uh, treatment companies is that we do everything in solution based so it can be spray, dip, or uh, dispensed as opposed to using a vacuum chamber. Uh, in the electronic space, we've been uh, present for about five years now, uh, and we have a product called NanoClear, which is an award-winning stencil uh, technology. In fact, uh, we launched this uh, particular version in 2013, uh, and it is the number one global stencil nano-coating uh, product out there. The purpose of NanoClear is to modify stencils such that they can become flux repellent in a matter of minutes. In this particular application, it's a wipe applied uh, product for the underside of the stencil. Uh, and the benefits to customers, it has increased yields upward on the surface mount technology lines, improves print quality and reduces print variation, as well as lowers cost. It's been a very successful product and we've been fortunate enough to be acknowledged with several uh, leading industry awards for that particular product. But today we're here to talk about our Nanoproof series, which is designed for water, PCB water protection. Uh, we've been working on this series for some time, and we have some customers already in the marketplace, but recently we uh, have announced this more fully. So this, as I say, is a series of products designed to, to modify the surfaces of PCB to be water repellent. Uh, in talking to potential customers, the primary objective for most of our customers has been to keep water away from the surfaces. Uh, it is a series of four products at this stage. We are looking to extend that uh, product line. Uh, one of those products, including Nanoproof uh, 5.0, is actually hydrophobic and oleophobic, so it will keep away oils and grease uh, away. But the majority of the uh, feedback from customers is they wanted their devices to be water repellent uh, because it would protect the device and reduce the product failure, uh, thereby increasing the product life and also reducing the returns. Uh, these coatings are also such that uh, you can rework them, which will allow you to uh, improve your yield. Uh, and overall, they should reduce your system-wide cost as basically you're reducing the returns and increasing yield. It utilizes some proprietary technology we have, and we've been benchmarking these against competitive coatings in terms of both performance and ease of use, and we like to believe that we have a, a superior product offering. As this is a range of products, uh, we like to think it's select, apply, and save. So you have the range of products, as you'll learn during this webinar, is designed to protect against different levels of water, uh, from humidity to full immersion. So you have to choose which product is appropriate for you. 
uh, then you have to choose which application methodology is appropriate for you. Uh, and by applying it then, obviously, we expect you to get some of the benefits that are listed above. Aculon really is a specialist in surface modification uh, treatments. We do a variety of uh, treatments. They include hydrophobic, obviously keeping water away, hydrophilic to make it water attracting, oleophobic to keep oils and grease away, and oleophilic as well. We're based here in uh, sunny uh, San Diego in California, and you can find more details on our website at aculon.com. Just to give you a quick history of the company. Uh, some of the technology where we started as a business back in 2004 had about uh, 20, 30 years of development, uh, particularly for some of our self-assembled monolayers. Well, work was done at MIT in the 1980s, at Princeton in the 1990s, uh, and the founders of the company licensed some technology from Princeton to start that. Uh, and we've basically been using that technology for optical display, consumer industrial electronics, and oil. We have a pretty broad patent portfolio. Uh, and as surface modification experts, over the years, we've found that companies often come to us with problems related to, to surfaces. And so while our initial patent portfolio was relating to self-assembled monolayers for phosphonates and organometallics, we subsequently added polymeric organometallics, transition metal complexes, and other surface modification technologies to provide a pretty broad suite of technologies that can modify these surfaces. In the nanoproof series that we're talking about today, uh, we have used a variety of these uh, technologies to basically achieve different levels of performance and barrier properties depending on what is appropriate. Our expertise and uh, platforms that we focus on are all related to surface modification. The initial products for the company started in the display and the optical uh, lens area where we would do uh, prescription eyewear, we would do sunglasses, and since then we've broadened into a variety of marketplaces including mold release, including stencils as I talked about with the NanoClear product. Uh, we also for oil and gas applications for rock formation, uh, for particle formations, for things like fuel cells, uh, but today we're going to talk about our PC protection uh, line of products. So let me get into a little more details about the Nanoproof series. And for those of you who are on the business of uh, producing and uh, making printed circuit boards, you understand why you need waterproofing. You know, in real life or even in uh, medical or industrial applications, often water basically can damage the board, uh, causing it to short. Uh, causing it to short and to fail. Uh, so whether the consumer drops the device in a pool or even a toilet, or whether the unit is exposed to the outdoor environment, if it's sitting on a post or sitting uh, outside such as lighting and rain and humidity is getting there, sometimes that humidity will get in uh, and cause the board to fail. Or household appliances, obviously things like washing machines, refrigerators have a lot of moisture around those units. And again, that can cause the board to fail. Uh, for equipment, whether it's industrial, medical, whether you're exposed to uh, wet working environments or even bodily fluids, again, you often want to protect those boards so uh, the boards can continue to function to operate. So if we look at some of the benefits of what we're doing with this Nanoproof series, um, obviously this is all about water protection. And as I say, we go from the low end where we're trying to protect against humidity, uh, to somewhere where you're splashing water against it, accidental water damage, to full-on water immersion. Uh, the objective, obviously, is that you know by we can reduce the product returns uh, due to water damage, will improve your yields, and in many cases we find that our customers don't need to mask. In some cases, if they have a specific or sensitive area, perhaps a, a microphone, uh, they may decide to mask on that. But a lot of the times we're seeing that uh, people don't need to mask uh, their boards. The coating is safe, all of the series is safe, non-toxic, and can be used in a factory environment. So we offer a variety of features uh, from that, and we'll get into a little bit more details about this in just one second. So the Nanoproof series goes from basically nanoscale to microns, so from ultra thin to, to still very thin. Uh, it's very economical to use. We'll show you some usage rates if you are spraying or dipping a board, what you'd expect to be able to use. Uh, we have options for you in terms of whether you want to dip or spray or dispense. And some of the products, in fact, uh, Nano, Nanoproof 5.0 has three different variants on that to basically optimize the application methodology to your requirement. 
Very limited equipment uh, is required. It's not like a vacuum chamber, uh, but rather you can basically, obviously, a dipping is probably the easiest. Uh, spraying and dispensing, you would need some spray nozzles or, or a particular dispense equipment. From that. Across this range, we have put UV tracer into the nanoproof series with the goal that under UV light, uh, your quality control people can see that the uh, board is appropriately uh, treated and coated, uh, and that gives you some assurance that basically those key components uh, have now been uh, nanoproofed. What you'll expect is that uh, you know, nanoproof will deliver a contact angle, water contact angle above 100 degrees. Uh, and that it has the ability to treat a broad range of substrates that are on the PCB. Obviously, it's a multi-material uh, structure when you're talking about a printed circuit board. As you can see from the photographs on the earlier page, uh, uh, the product comes in uh, liquid format. It will come in one liter or larger sizes. Uh, as I say, it goes from very thin to, uh, to, to thin. has no impact on conductivity and thermally stable up to 200 degrees C and is easy to rework. Josh, why don't you uh, take the group through a little bit about some of the differences and a bit more about some of the product features of this uh, Nanoproof series. So the, the table we're looking at, starting from left to right, you have Nanoproof 1.0, Nanoproof 3.5, 4.0, and 5.0. Uh, from left to right, you have increasing barrier protection and subsequently also increasing cost. Uh, nanoproof 1.0 is nanometer thick uh, transition metal complex based coating that creates a hydrophobic barrier primarily designed for protection against accidental water contact. Nanoproof 3.5 is micron thick hydrophobic siloxane based coating which can provide protection of bare circuits to water submersion. Additionally, 3.5 allows for push through conductivity as it's deformable. This means that if you want to make an electrical connection after you've coated a board, you have a very high success rate of doing that. Uh, though this does necessitate a careful handling of a coated part, as if you touch a sensitive area in the coat, a sensitive area that's been coated, you can decrease the barrier there and subsequently make it more susceptible to water damage. Uh, Nanoproof 4.0 provides an even higher level of protection to bare circuits than 3.5 while retaining the feature of push-through conductivity. Nanoproof 5.0 is the most robust barrier to liquids that we offer. It's oleophobic as well as hydrophobic. 5.0 is a fluoroacrylate based coating that creates micron thick barriers which allow for push through conductivity while the film sets. After the film is set, this is not likely to happen. But as a corollary, handling a part once the film is set is very easy to do and you're unlikely to damage the coating. Depending on the part to be coated and the manufacturing process you employ, Nanoproof series is adaptable to dipping, spraying, and dispensing. Dipping is typically done with a 30 second dwell time at ambient conditions. Drying time varies by the Nanoproof solvent, and we recommend a, circulating, a recirculating bath that is filtered for dipping operations. Depending on how populated your board is, we find that typically less than a mill a milliliter of coating solution will coat a three inch by five inch board. Uh, spraying can be accomplished with uh, no to minimal masking depending on the formulation used or your equipment and cycle times are short uh, depending on what your process is and the amount of material needed to protect sensitive parts. We do find Dispensing is an effective method for applying nanoproof that can save money by selectively applying the coatings where it's needed most. Maybe Josh, you could uh, talk a little bit about some of the advantages over more traditional conformal coatings, as I'm sure the audience is uh, wondering what the differences are. So, highlights of the nanoproof series over traditional conformal coatings are process flexibility, minimal capital investment needed, continuous production over batch, uh, push through conductivity reworkability, and minimal to no masking. Uh, additionally, the nanoproofs are safe and non-toxic. And against Paraline? Uh, in comparison to Paraline, the nanoproof series offers similar advantages. Process flexibility, continuous production, fast cycle times, uh, in particular for versus Paraline, you have no size limitations on the part as you're not confined by whatever size vacuum chamber you buy. Uh, due to the low surface energy of the carrier solvents for the Nanoproof series, complex parts are easily coated. Uh, parts are reworkable and batteries can be treated. 
And I should have said at the start that the, a copy of this presentation uh, will be emailed to the uh, attendees and certainly be available on our website afterwards. So let me uh, switch for a minute and talk a little bit about uh, devices. Some of you are probably uh, uh, very keen on that. Uh, and uh, so we have done some work uh, with devices and what we've found is that we are compatible with key components uh, and that we can deliver something called IPX7 performance and beyond. IPX7 is a, a metric or a, a test that basically calls for 30 minutes immersion at one meter of, of depth. However, what we will say when it comes to devices is that every device is unique uh, and everything needs to be tested. So how the device and the architecture of the device is uh, put together will impact the ingress uh, of water and so in the flow of water into that device. So uh, devices are complicated obviously in terms of uh, assembly and taking apart, uh, but uh, we've seen a lot of uh, good uh, testing that has been done with that. And the key components that we don't impact, uh, we've, we've seen uh, whether it's the antenna, the headphone and the microphone, push buttons, camera, speakers, uh, sealed LCD di display. Clearly, if you have an unsealed LCD display, as these coatings have very low surface energy, they are going to find their way into that display and they will damage that display. So uh, please don't attempt to use the nanoproof series of, of treatments with an unsealed LCD display. I will also say with a caveat, uh, uh, thickest barrier property uh, uh, coating nanoproof 5.0. Uh, we have some customers that are not masking with that, but uh, if you have a membrane such as a microphone or a speaker, again, you need to test it to make sure that it doesn't have an impact. Uh, we have a customer that masks the microphone because they are concerned about that after having worked with uh, nanoproof 5.0. So uh, some of the more sensitive components, again, uh, please uh, make sure you test that. But let's spend a, a minute talking a little bit about IPX and how we stack up against that. So the, the IPX standards were designed for measuring how a finished device endures against varying degrees of water exposure. So IPX 1 to 6 are talking minimally about limited amounts of spraying or splashing in water. Uh, whereas IPX 7 and 8, you're talking about full submersion of a finished device. Let's see how we do against that. So we find that for IPX 0 through 4, that all nanoproofs are effective barriers. Uh, IPX 5 through 7, uh, nanoproof 3.5, 4.0, and 5.0 are effective barriers. And if you're going for continuous submersion, 5.0 is going to be your best option. So for our testing, we coated IPC B-25A boards with nanoproofs and then immersed the bare board in water and salt water for 60 minutes at 3, 6, or 12 volts. While submerged, we measured the current that flowed across the comb. This slide is just loading. Mm -hmm. So here we have a sample of our results for nanoproof 4.0 versus uncoated boards. The left graph shows a large and immediate current flow of uncoated boards. The scales in milliamps, uh, the detector we used pegged at about one amp. And you'll see that at the applied voltages, different amounts of current flowed. Uh, it's not shown here. Uh, if you want to download our technical paper, I believe we have pictures of it. But the copper was stripped off under the electrolysis action of the applied voltages under these conditions. On the right side, you see nanoproof 4.0. Uh, essentially at all voltages tracing out at zero. The detection limit on our current sensor was half a milliamp and we measured no appreciable current over the entire duration of test. Uh, to compare the two graphs, the orange line you see at the top of the left is the same one you see at the bottom of the right. So basically, because obviously the, the graph on the right hand side looks a little bit strange, you adjusted the scale uh, down and so you can see the orange goes off the top of the uh, scale on the right hand side, but across the bottom you can see the nanoproof basically showing uh, no detection, right? Yes, we can. So for those of you interested in seeing more of our test data, further explanation of how we conducted our tests, uh, the, t the technical paper we've produced is available on our website and we encourage you to download it and uh, decide which nanoproof you want to use for your electronics. 
and that technical paper will have the different voltages as well as it has some competitive testing on there so uh, and a detailed explanation of the process that uh, Josh and the team here used so uh, to sum up we find that nanoproof 3.5 exceeds IPX7 nanoproof uh, 4.0 exceeds IPX7 and uh, nanoproof 5.0 exceeds IPX7 and 8 as I indicated, we did some uh, competitive testing, and some of those results are in that uh, technical paper, which is available for downloading. So let's talk about some uh, considerations uh, as it relates to performance. Uh, again, we start with every device is different, and you need to test it. Um, so in general, we have seen no impact on signal strength or speakers or microphone, camera, antenna. Uh, so one of the key things that we've decided to do here is rather than have uh, one product that fits all uh, is that uh, because obviously you know you can potentially have a lower cost product is is if you determine what performance requirement you need that will help drive the selection of which nanoproof so if you are looking for something to protect humidity against humidity you may be able to use nanoproof 1.0 if you are looking for something that occasional water gets on you may be able to use nanoproof 3.5 or nanofoot 4.0, and if you're looking for something that's designed to protect against kind of full submersion or immersion, uh, then you may want to be going with uh, nanofoot 5.0. So which performance requirement is going to drive which product you have, which as, as we indicated is going to impact the coating thickness. They go from, uh, from ultra thin with uh, 1.0 to micron thin with 5.0, uh, and it increases the cost accordingly. Uh, also, the selection will impact uh, the types of handling requirements uh, and potentially the manufacturing process. So, as we get to 5.0, we have specific products designed for dip, dispense, uh, and spray. So, deciding which application method is available to you uh, obviously will help drive that, and we can certainly work with you on that. And the final thing, which uh, my technologist would uh, would be upset if I didn't talk about, uh, is that is board cleaning. So. As surface modification experts, uh, we like to make sure that the surfaces we treat are clean before we treat them. We're putting down very, very thin uh, coatings on these surfaces, and we need to make sure that they are clean. So the cleaner, the better. Um, there are a number of commercially available PCB cleaning solutions out there. Uh, we can work with you on that. That's what we'd recommend is cleaning the boards prior to, uh, uh, to treating the boards. And if you do that, you are going to get a better uh, product out of it. So in summary, um, you know, we are the leading supply of nanoscale repellency technology. Uh, we've had a great success with our electronics uh, stencil product, the NanoClear product. Uh, we're very excited to be uh, launching uh, broadly the NanoProof series of product, which we've been in beta test with a number of customers and, and had some great results. And so uh, we've designed this as a range of products uh, because people have different requirements. Uh, and it seemed based on the different requirements, providing different options would be the way to go. Uh, samples are available on our website, uh, and uh, they can certainly be bought from that. Uh, and we've had a lot of customers who are looking by one or two or three, uh, and so they can test and determine which one is appropriate for them. Uh, all of them are easy to apply, and uh, you know, as we've talked about, they're either spray, dispense, or dip. And you know, by doing this, you should obviously improve the performance of the board as well as increase uh, yield, allowing you to reduce cost. And we believe that it outperforms the competitive technology. And as a business, uh, we are set up to supply uh, the product and the treatments to you globally. So at Aculon, uh, we always think about you know driving performance on the surface, and we do it via solutions. And that's kind of what we do as a business. Uh, so with that. Um, let me uh, pause for questions. Um, as I say, samples are available here. And uh, there is contact info for myself, Edward Hughes, and for my uh, business development co colleague, Mario Gattuso, who's uh, coordinating this. But uh, Mario, do we have any, uh, any questions we can help with? Uh, yes, there are quite a few questions. So lots to go over here. Um, the first question that has popped in is, how durable is nanoproof? The, the coating isn't meant to be a, uh, it, it's protective against water durability. It's, be curious to know more about what they want to know. Uh, it, abrasion durability is not something it's designed to do. 
in terms of it lasting exposure to oxygen, uh, exposure to light, it's got great durability. But it, you wouldn't consider this an abrasion durable coating, none of them. Okay, thank you, Josh. Uh, next question is, a uh, very good question is, uh, can this product be applied over no clean flux? Oh, yeah, that's an, that's an excellent one. This is Eric Hansen speaking. So the no clean flux, this is something we've run into in the past where people have applied our chemistry on top of uh, boards that have had no clean flux used. A lot of times these no clean fluxes have essentially fatty acid compounds to react with the metal oxide, get it off there so that you can do a soldering. Problem is that stuff's left behind. And whereas it's not water soluble, it is uh, solvent soluble to some degree. So people will see some whitening or re essentially redistribution of that that uh, spent uh, flux residue you know, across the board. So we do recommend that even people using essentially a no clean flux, that they may need to do uh, cleaning of that material. Because once you uh, start applying water and voltage, you've now got this sort of partially conductive you know, residue still present, even if it's underneath our coating, which could, which could cause some problems. OK, thank you, Eric. Uh, does do any of the nanoproof options require special pray, pray, spray equipment, and can we use our existing spray systems for the coating of uh, for coating acrylic conformal coatings? You should be able to use the existing equipment. Um, most of our these materials are essentially designed to be used in the standard kind of spray equipment that, that's used, like ASIM textile machines. Uh, we've tested it with HVLP sprayers here. It's not really the ideal, you know, air-driven sprayers are not really ideal. Uh, but if you've already got acrylic conformal spraying equipment, that should, it should go in uh, easily. Let's see. Next question up is for uh, NanoProof 5.0, what is a typical oil contact angle? Oil contact angles are what, about 78 or so? Yeah, high 70s. Yeah, that's, the, that's what I remember reading. So what would be an untreated contact Un angle? Untreated, um, depends on the substrate, but somewhere Less. between 10 to 20 degrees yeah. contact angle with oil. Hard to read. Yeah, hard, <laughs> hard to read on the machine. If, if, uh, if you were to put this uh, 5.0 in a, an aluminum pan and, and, and coat that, you could fill it with oil and, and watch the oil just you know roll around inside of the uh, pan wouldn't wet the surface. Okay. How is the product cured when applied? Is it a UV, a heat cure, or is it just room temperature? Room temperature drying is what we typically do. If you want to increase cycle times on some of the more slow drying formulations, uh, a quick cure is, is possible. It doesn't damage the coating. But typically we just do air drying at room temperature. And I think you in the chat said that the longest one was 30 minutes. Is that longest about? Longest one is 30 yeah. minutes. That's that's the sprayable formulation in, in 5.0. You can reduce the drying rates by basically going to a sure. solvent that evaporates faster. Okay. We we can kind of keep this flexibility in the formulation so that if the customer has a very specific set of equipment with a certain length of the line, so to speak, and and have existing ovens and so on, that we can kind of tailor the formulation a little bit to exactly what they've got. Just Again, kind of keeping that theme of making it easy to use. Okay, next question that's come through is, uh, which application process is better, dispensing, manual spray, or dipping? It, it really depends on your process and your part. It, we'd like to be able to give you an easy answer, but it, it comes down to testing uh, and what you need in the areas that are going to cause the most problems on your part. Next question is, do we do you have any experience with LED applications, specifically optically clear and requiring no outgassing, no degassing? I mean, we've, testing with uh, we've done testing of uh, kind of qualification with LED, uh, LEDs in lab. Uh, I don't find, uh, to my eye, that the color changes at all. Uh, typically, we've done that with 5.0. Um, and we, we've been able to take devices that will fail instantly to being able to stay on submerged for up to 40 minutes. Um, I believe we probably do better, but uh, I'm not sure. We haven't been able to test outgassing yet. 
But uh, can we code an LED and keep it working underwater? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next question is, we use a specialty coding robot. Uh, it needs to be cleaned um, once done. And is your coding easy to clean um, once the uh, once the uh, job is done? Yeah, we can supply solvents for, for cleaning after after use. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It's no, no uh, be just like cleaning a, a paintbrush or something with paint thinner. It's just like that. Just take the right solvent, wash down, and should be should be good to go. Um, is there a, I'm not sure if this person is inquiring because they want high temperature curing or if it's not desirable, but the person has asked, is there a high temperature curing step? Um, no, no, none of them require high temperature curing. Um, they can take some, some high temperatures uh, you know, after being coated, so I don't know if that was maybe the concern. Yeah, we wouldn't recommend going over 200C for any of the coatings. Right. Yeah, so I think it's the, the design that they don't require a cure. If you want to increase the uh, speed of the line, et cetera, then a cure is there. But uh, don't uh, don't go over 200C. Uh, next question is, can it be applied over a traditional conformal coating such as perylene in order to uh, obtain additional performance and protection? I, I can't see why it wouldn't be able to be applied over something like that. One, three point five, and four point oh. I would assume would. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure if five point would stick. I wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think it might. It will. Yeah. Yeah, actually, no, it probably would. Yeah. So the answer is probably. We just <laughs> never been asked that. <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 usually, we usually get the uh, question, which is, uh, we want to replace that. So uh, as opposed to, can you do both? So, but. Uh, uh, that's kind of the value proposition for us is replacing some of the other conformal parallel encodings as opposed to doubling down, but uh, it's possible. Okay, next next question. Um, are these materials currently being used in any OEMs or CEMs um, that you can reference? Uh, the answer is yes, they are being used, uh, obviously for Confidentiality purposes, we cannot uh, give you the names of, uh, of our customers, but uh, we have been working with some customers over a time period uh, to basically make sure that these products are working. And uh, uh, so it's, it's commercially available, being commercially used, but uh, we can't share customer names. Let's see. How do you test or check whether the coding is on the surface? Now it's why we formulated with a UV tracer. Uh, Fluoresce is blue under 365 nanometer light. Uh, we use a small UV lamp in lab, and uh, it enables an easy inspection of how well you coated your surface. And I think Josh, these UV lamps are pretty inexpensive, right? Yeah, uh, around two hundred dollars. So it's a fairly easy test. Uh, the coatings are designed to be clear, colorless. Uh, maybe when you get to the 5.0, you can see it a little bit. Uh, but uh, obviously, when uh, you uh, and a lot of people don't want a, a big, uh, heavy coating on their board, um, and so when you get to QC purposes, then yes, a UV lamp uh, basically illuminates blue, and uh, and you can see the treatment on that. The questions continue on. Many more coming in. Keep them coming. Next question is, do connections or solderable surfaces need to be masked? Uh, it depends a little bit on the application for uh, the 1.0, 3.5, and 4.0. Uh, no masking is required. Those, those chemistries are essentially designed around having a push-through conductivity at all times. So even if it's you know a week later, you can still push through, connect, and so on. 5.0 does have a, a, a bit of a working time, so that generally is somewhere around an hour or so, I guess, uh, during which time you need to make your push-through connections. Because if once that film, once the 5.0 film is solidified, you'd have to use a little bit of fluorosolvent to loosen it before you could make a connection. So, for the for the first three, there they are they are workable for 
you know. Indefinitely. Indefinitely, yeah. So Eric, maybe you can give an example of when you say push through con connectivity, what are you referring to? What are you going to connect to that board? For so this might be, for an example, if you have a clamshell clam style uh, device where you might want to be hooking up a, a display to the board, you have to push in one of those little multi-pin connectors with, with a polyimid, you know, flex line attached to it, something like that. Okay. Or for a camera lens, for example. Let's see. Next question is: Can you dip coat unsealed switches? Uh, with with one three point five and four point zero, yes. Five point zero. Uh, you'd have to test. I would. I'm leaning no, but you might be able to. Depends on a lot of factors. I'm thinking the switch might actually start to wear on the contacting points as the switch is cycled. It might actually wear wear it away and then or you start to get works. electrical contact. Yeah. But I don't. I don't recall the effort. It's not something we test the switch. Yep. Next question is. Has any testing been done for protection against steam, such as what is used as a, in an autoclave? No. We've done salt fog and moisture and MIR, but no. Yeah, salt fog and MIR testing, but I don't know we've done uh, steam per se. So, would you expect to be a problem? I don't. No. Right. Uh, none of these I, I see being a real problem in steam. Uh, again, we don't recommend going over 200 degrees Celsius, but from what I understand, autoclaves are not getting that hot. It's just pressure and heat. Right, and the salt fog is probably a pretty good proxy, isn't it? Salt fog is mainly mainly to do with corrosion. Corrosion, yeah. Right. The only difference between you know, the steam is, is obviously that the temperature factor. It's hot, but yeah. So. Okay. Next question is. How do these various treatments compare to perylene? Well, I think we covered a little bit of that in the uh, in the table there, so maybe that question came in before we went through the comparison table. So um, I'm not sure there's anything else you guys need to add to that, as uh, as opposed to that could have been just a timing issue with the question. Yeah, I, I think we offer uh, some very significant advantages in terms of the process, the investment. Um, we offer uh, good uh, protection, but yeah, it's a, they're different animals. Yeah. And and to add that, there's been there's been some customers who come by and, and said they've been using a perylene style treatment of not getting the job done. Right. And then they applied some of our chemistry instead of the perylene that it tends to work. It it seems like these you know the device architectures you know sometimes will cause perylene to have difficulty for whatever reason. That's correct. And then again, as, as Edward mentioned, it's there's a lot more detail in the presentation and, and we'll be mailing that out and the recording, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available for download, both the uh, PowerPoint and the recording, so you can always go back to review. Um, but anyways, on to the next question. Um, next one's very similar, so I'm going to skip that, asking about the comparison to acrylic and formal coatings, and I think um, we've answered that. Um, next question is, what are the carrier solvents? Do you have a hydrocarbon solvent for nanoproof 1, 3.5, and 4.0? And then you have, depending on whether you want to dip, dispense, or spray for 5.0, we have a different fluorosolvent blend. Uh, next question is, do we have measured viscosities of the various treatments? Or I, yeah, one, three point five, and four point oh, they should all be very low under under a centipoise. For five point oh, depends on the concentration of solids. Yeah, it, that might be in the one to ten centipoise range. I'm not sure. We would need, we would need to measure those actually. They're, they're fairly light. Uh, are there any disadvantages for a surface that has been overcoated or has been coated to be too thick? The only thing that could be impacted would be the push through connectivity, like for 5.0, for example. Like if you did two, if you did two coatings, sprayed it 
let it dry, spray it again, and you have a fairly thick coating there. And you may not be able to do a push pin connection. So 3.5 and 4.0, have we seen no problems with over treatment? No. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think so. Other than it costs more, obviously, to <laughs> yeah, spend more money for board and yeah. to do that, but uh, in general, no. Uh, next question is, does the thickness impact uh, conductivity? I mean, the, the films themselves aren't conductive. Uh, for the ones uh, 1.0, 3.5, and 4.0, uh, that you're going to be able to push through them when you want to make connections. So it's, it's not going to impact conductivity. Uh, 5.0, if you put a very thick barrier on there, you're going to have to peel it off or uh, use fluorosolvent to rewet it if you want to go through it. Okay, Edward, this next question is probably uh, up your alley, is if we tested uh, the materials and want to use the product going forward, how do we obtain it? Is it a direct uh, model or through a distributor in our local area? Uh, so uh, it depends a little bit on the region. Um, so uh, in the case of the U.S., we uh, distribute uh, directly ourselves. Uh, in the case of uh, Asia, we have some uh, distributors uh, that are going to be carrying the product locally that we would uh, turn you to because obviously they could get that product to you, uh, to you quicker. Uh, so the best thing to do would be to contact uh, either myself or Mario and uh, we could get you that information. But uh, we have a mixed, uh, mixed model. Uh, as I say, predominantly in Asia, we have more distributors. And in the U.S. and uh, Europe, we distribute ourselves. Okay, next question is, uh, what are some common coating cosmetic defects uh, which are seen when um, unideal application is utilized, such as fish eyes or de-wetting? Yep, you might, you might see some haziness uh, in, in the coatings. If you were to put it on a, on a clear substrate, you might see a little bit of haze. And yeah, you could see some, uh, not fish eye, but orange peel style uh, kind of defects where one area is slightly higher than the other one. And honestly, kind of does look like a little, little bit like an orange peel. That usually happens when the solvent is really rapidly dried uh, by heating the substrate from other <coughs> things or something like that. So that, that can happen, uh, but it's, it's usually, usually someone not being careful with the, with the material or doing something out of spec. Next question is nanoproof alcohol and chlorine proof. Well, we've done sodium. We've done testing in salt water in sodium chloride. Yeah. Uh, alcohols. I wouldn't expect it. Any, no. Won't, yeah, it won't dissolve the coating. Alcohols won't. I don't know how the inclusion of alcohol changes the. Uh, the current, the current flow, like if it was a solution of alcohol and water, I don't think it would have an effect because water is more aggressive than pretty much everything. And we've already tested the 5% sodium chloride in water. So so I guess the answer is it shouldn't have an impact, but, uh, but please test it. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Let's see. Next question is, because perylene is vapor applied and these materials are liquid applied, my assumption is the ed edge thickness does not compare to perylene. Do you have any information on this? Uh, it's not something we've measured. We do find you can do uh, multiple applications in a far shorter cycle time. So if you need to build up edge thickness, it's something that's e easily achieved. Uh, it depends on your part. Well, we shouldn't have anything where we do it's expected to build up on edges, preferentially over a flat surface. No, no, no. You, you won't get like uh, the same exact coating thickness on an edge that you got on the essentially the floor of the component or, or where it touches the board, um, as you as you might get with perylene because of the sort of layer by layer, almost like atomic layer right. position. Yeah. Let's see. This next question. Um, doesn't indicate what application method, so um, the question is just application rate, question mark. And so if you ask that question, if you can maybe clarify, it would be helpful, but um, maybe you guys can try and elaborate on the application rate. 
I think in the uh, presentation, Josh, you talked about uh, dipping is 30 seconds. Is that right? We typically do a 30 second dwell time. Um, every part is unique. Uh, it, it depends on your part. Uh, it, depending on how thick you want it, faster withdrawal rates from dipping tend to leave thicker coatings, which some people want. If you want thinner, you do slower. Um, it, it's about your process and not only what you can tolerate, but what your end goals are and what your test of success is at the end for your part. And then spraying, I think you were saying, is a matter of seconds. Oh, it's, it's very quick, yeah. So I, so I think if, it's, if the question is how fast can you apply it, then you know, matter of seconds up to 30 seconds is kind of standard for what we do for dip application. Great. And I have two questions that have come in simultaneously, which are pretty much the same thing, is do the coated surface remain solderable, or can you solder through a coated um, PCBA? Uh, with the Nanoproof uh, 1.0, 3.5, and 4.0, you can solder through it. Uh, with 5.0, during the set time of the film, you can solder through it. Afterwards, you're going to want to try reworking or loosening up the film with some fluorosolvent so you can make that connection reliably. Yeah, generally what we recommend is that the film is set, you take a Q-tip you know, uh, or a, or a uh, clean room swab, dip in a little solvent, rub it over the area that you want to solder, and then go ahead. Okay, next question is, uh, do these uh, various products have low boiling points? Uh, need a definition on low, but I would venture to say no. Like what, what temperature would they consider low? Well, uh, maybe we could, can you give a range of the various boiling points, Josh? Uh, that well, that the, might be helpful. Yeah, so the, the 1.0, 3.5, and uh, 4.0, uh, solvent boiling point is 90 to 110. Uh, depending on the formulation we're using for 5.0, whether you want to dip. Okay, C or F. Uh, sorry, centigrade. centigrade. Uh, I speak centigrade. Um, for 5.0, depending on which application you're looking to do, dip, spray, or dispense, uh, the solvent blend is probably going to boil some to, somewhere between 85 and 140 degrees C. Okay, thank you, Josh. Next question is, do these products comply with Rojas and REACH regulations? Yes, we believe we're the ones we're aware of, yes. They're designed not to have any heavy metals or PFOAs or anything like that. And no, no BTEX, you know. Okay. Next question is, when you make a push-through connection, does the connection remain sealed? Uh, Assuming that the thickness uh, covers the bare metal lead, yes. It uh, depends on what you're bringing in, because the part you're bringing in hasn't been coated, so I can't talk about that part. Uh, underneath where you push through, yes, it's still sealed. Um, let's see. Where does the product ship from? Uh, so we produce... Uh, here in California, um, we would ship from California, as I indicated earlier. If it's uh, in Asia, uh, we have some distributors, and so they would be carrying the product locally there, but uh, for the U.S. market, coming from California. Our next question is somebody is asking if uh, it can pass a regular test, uh, test tape for adhesion. So cross hatch tape deal is um, what I'm guessing. Yeah, that's I that's. That, yeah, I know that at least on a on a clean substrate that uh, they're testing with 5.0. Yes, it does. I don't know if we've tested 3.5 and 4.0, but you, you have to realize a 1.0, 3.5, 4.0. .0, you know, those coatings are still sort of semi-liquid once they're down. So you'd be applying the tape and then pulling off a top surface layer of that coating. Um, not much of it, really. I assume it would look normal, but you'd probably be pulling a little with you. You would pull a small yeah. amount off. So it's yes, it, probably would, it would pass the tape peel test, but you have to realize what you're actually doing when you run that test is removing a small amount of material because it doesn't stick at it's all. Not, so in other words, it's not really a relevant test for 
3.5 and 4.0. Yeah, for the, yes. the 1.0 through, well, oh, sorry, from the 1 through 4, not really. For the 5.0, yeah, once that's cured, if you, you could do a cross hatch state seal test on it. Because that is a solid, that is a solid film. Um, have you done any accelerated life testing, um, such as what is used in automotive or medical? Uh, so our customers do that. Uh, we don't see any degradation of the performance over over the life of uh, the treated board, uh, particularly because obviously most of these uh, cases, you know, the board is not going to see wear or abrasion, these type of things. They're just uh, testing against water, so it should not have an impact on the uh, the life of the board uh, from that standpoint. Okay, next question is how much nanoproof is needed for a certain size area of board? Well, I think we gave uh, a little bit of an idea of that when we talked about uh, for I think the dipping application we were for a three inch by five inch board, so something like a mobile device, we were talking about less than a mil, uh, and for a similar air of spray somewhere between a mil and a mil and a half. So it really obviously depends on the size of the board, but uh, uh, it goes down uh, it goes goes down pretty thin. Next question is, when breaking through the coating with mounting screws, et cetera, et cetera, will water migrate under the coating? Uh, that's not our experience, no. Okay, next question. Um, in a previous answer, you said the film is conductive. Did you mean the current can pass through the film thickness, but not in the direction parallel to, a parallel to application? or not the other dimension. Okay. Yeah, it won't it won't impact conductivity of a coated trace, for example, if you if you take uh, two traces side by side, you know, you, you put the coating over top, it's not going to impact conductivity through those traces. It's by design meant to uh, keep conductivity from uh, from uh, bridging. Yeah, bridging, bridging those two contacts. Yeah, we, do, we don't find the coatings in and of themselves are conductive. Right. If, they, if they were conductive, then this wouldn't this, work very well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, your treatment. It would short everything. It would, it would short everything, yes. You wouldn't have to worry about water. Yeah, it, it, would, it would ruin the yeah, device on its own. So the, the coating does not conduct electricity. It's insulating and does not conduct electricity on, uh, along itself, but um, connections can be made through the coating. Through the coating, yes. Okay, that should clear things up. Um, next question is, somebody is wondering how well the material works under extreme conditions. In other words, uh, negative 40 Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, based on the chemistry, they should survive both very well. Um, particularly the, the 1.0 through, through 4.0. Um, what they're made of are is extremely temperature insensitive. Yeah. Uh, great material properties over that range. Um, based on our testing, I'd say the same for 5.0. And then I have two questions asking about some certification ratings, about mil, a mil spec rating, MIL 460 58C, um, or IPC CC 830, and uh, for biocompatibility, ISO 10993. I think at this stage we have not done mil spec or any of the okay, IPC. IPC or biocompatibility things. That's not to say they wouldn't pass. It's just not something that we've gone through the process of. Uh, you know, if our customers are interested in that, uh, then we can certainly look into that. But it's just not a task we've taken on at this stage. Okay. Let's see the next question. Uh, are you planning to test repellency or have you tested uh, for other fluids um, such as what, for example, what's used in automotive applications such as brake fluid and gasoline? Uh, we, we tested uh, the coatings against uh, N-hexadecanes, our oil contact angle numbers. As for uh, performance within gasoline, no, we haven't tested that. 
I think uh, I think during the presentation we talked about that uh, nanoproof 5.0 is both hydrophobic and oleophobic, so to expect to see the high con oil contact angles we talked about, but on the others uh, they are just hydrophobic. So you would expect oil, not, yeah, you know, gasoline and those type of things. So uh, so if you're looking for an oleophobic uh, offering in addition to hydrophobic, then uh, focus on nanoproof 5.0. Yeah. Okay, next question that's come in is if you want to have a thinner thickness for each type of the coating, what is your recommendation for application or for achieving a thinner thickness? Solution. Yeah, but lower the solid content. So take the we can we can provide or, or give you a source of where to purchase uh, diluent solvent. Yeah, and that's and to clarify yeah, that exactly that we can um, for implementation into production, we can work to customize the concentration to meet your needs. Um, you know, once you've once you've tested samples and confirmed, we can we can help to optimize. Uh, right, uh, we can do that, but uh, obviously we've been testing these against you know standard performance requirements, etc. So we wouldn't be encouraging to constantly dilute down the product. Right. So uh, you know. And I think you know this is going to go down pretty economically if you look at, you know, a mil per, you know, for a three inch by five inch, etc. So it's it's a pretty in a inexpensive way to uh, protect your board and obviously get the benefits of uh, rework and reduce product returns. So uh, we wouldn't want everyone to be going around diluting the product. How do you advise I test to see if the waterproof coating is good for my part? Well, we have, uh, you know, what we've seen in uh, developing this and working with customers, they have a huge variety of tests from uh, medical device guys who are worried about uh, splashing of the occasional water or bodily fluid onto their device <laughs> to other people that will say they want to do IPX7 to other customers that want to do even greater, longer periods of immersion and and uh, in a variety of solutions. So as I said during the presentation, you need to determine which type of performance or what performance spec that you want um, and then obviously uh, basically connect the device, connect the board, or uh, turn power on the unit uh, and test against those conditions. So, uh, uh, you, know, with, you know, if you want something very simple for humidity, then you may not only need something straightforward like Nanoproof 1.0. If you want full immersion for an extended period of time, you know, you may want to be looking at 4.0 or 5.0. So, um, Without knowing specifically your application and the performance requirements, it's hard to give you an answer. But uh, you know, most people obviously power up the device and uh, put it into the conditions they need to to uh, test against. Next question that's come through is how the UV tracer uh, impacts the capabilities of the waterproof waterproof coating. We haven't found any impact from including the UV tracer. It's uh, one of the benefits of the, the molecules we're choosing as these is that you don't need a lot of them per weight of formulation. So you're talking somewhere between parts per billion and parts per million of UV tracer in there. Next question is, have you worked or partnered with any equipment manufacturer to help implement automati autom automation of the coding process? Uh, so we have worked with uh, uh, tested on a variety of pieces of equipment, et cetera. We don't have a uh, specific uh, partner uh, in terms of a piece of equipment we recommend. We'd, in many cases, we're hoping that our customers have the ability to uh, basically use their existing equipment. Uh, if a customer does want some help with that, we'd be more than happy to uh, uh, point them in the direction of who we think would be uh, provide compatible equipment, but uh, we don't have a dedicated partner, so it's no one's kind of tied to you have to buy this piece of equipment to run it. Okay, and it looks like the questions are winding down. If anyone else has any questions, get them in. Oh, let's, let's, okay, two more questions just came in. Um, what intensity of UV light is advised for the UV tracer is uh, another question that's come in. Uh, let me see if I can find that out. It's With a the lumen. It's fairly weak UV illumination. These are, these are basically handheld spot check units. 
the kind of thing that you might use in like an like a uh, airplane factory, ones they use to to inspect uh, turbines, or the the ones that basically are used in laboratories. Uh, it's a four watt UV lamp at yeah. 307, 365 nanometers is what I'm using to see in lab, and I get great visualization from that. Okay. Uh, and then one final question that's come in, unless anything further comes through, uh, is asking what type of PC PCB handling is uh, recommended or allowed after coating with 3.5 or 4.0? Uh, typically, you just want to hold it in an area that's not something you're trying to protect. Usually, there are plenty of parts on the board or the edge of the board where you can handle it and get it onto the next step of manufacturing without actually disturbing, say, the leads off an IC or where the power supply is coming in. Um, you just don't want to handle it in the areas you're trying to protect is what we're recommending. And that's because it still can deform, right? It, it's because it's deformable. So we have people basically doing this annually. And, you know, obviously it's going to be a piece of equipment you can you can uh, program in to not touch, you know, to be very careful with it. But we have people doing this literally with their with their hands. Their hands, so, though. They're getting good results. Yeah. Great. Well, that was a, a terrific group of uh, questions. So thank you for sending those in. We're uh, right up on the uh, on the hour. So again, uh, thank you for taking the time. We hope that you are uh, interested in the technology. Uh, as I say, it's they're designed as a series of products, so you can basically select the one that you want to do. Uh, you can apply it in a variety of methods, and obviously you'll benefit from uh, uh, savings and reduced returns and uh, an ability to rework it. So. Um, if you have further questions, please contact uh, Mario or myself, Edward Hughes, uh, on this. Uh, if they're technical questions, we'll, we'll go to our technical team here and we'll get those uh, answers back to you. Uh, if you do want uh, samples, then please go to the website. They are available for sale on that. Uh, that pricing you'll see on the website is designed as sample pricing. Uh, as you get into volumes, uh, then uh, again, please contact uh, Mario and uh, he can get you uh, pricing on that. Uh, so, uh, which is obviously much more uh, competitive and from a uh, volume standpoint. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for that and uh, we hope you've enjoyed the webinar and we look forward to uh, doing business with you in the future. Thank you.